Now it's time for Monty in the Morning. Hey, yo, man. How the heck are you? It is Monday, October 4th, 2021. Crazy weekend in sports. Yep. Got to talk about the NFL, which is the National Football League. Huge weekend in the NFL. Who's the best team in the NFL? Is there a best team in the Pac-12? Oh, UCLA. UCLA, 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 you let me down. We'll talk about that. We got to talk about Facebook. Jake is still a virgin. And there's nothing else going. So, good, good. Okay, good, good. Awkward. Uh, But we must start this fine show by reminding you that you need to subscribe uh, here on YouTube because we are meteorically rising to 2,500. Again, now. Last we left you, uh, you might remember that we were at about, what, 23-something. Right. 22-something. We are currently at 2,313 subs on this here program. So we're under 200 now. Left we are to go. under 200 under left 200 to go. Under 200 to go. I mean, you know. We have knocked out over 1,000 <clears throat> subscribers in just a month or so. So yeah, let's uh, yeah let's uh, let's get it done. All you have to do is hit subscribe. Uh, first, it starts with a thumbs up. If you're on the audio podcast, you need to get to themontyshow.com. Hit subscribe. Take a picture that you're subscribed. Tag us on uh, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok. SLC Supercars for Jake. The Monty Show for Pardon et Moi. And you're entered to win the Traeger Ironwood 650. By the way, the smoker was lit this weekend. It was. It was really good. Yeah, made a bunch you of made, different stuff. You made some pretty incredible wings. Wangs. Wangs. Uh, anyway, just do that. Tag us on Twitter, uh, Instagram, or TikTok. And by the way, we're making really good content on TikTok for you right now. Um, after our that video of the uh, Cafe Rio tortilla machine uh-huh. is now at three and a half million views. Damn. Like You're like an official TikToker now. I've had a viral video, which is different than a virus. This is just a viral video. Uh, Are we clear which, on that? Yeah, which is to say that we should talk BYU. Or as Kyle Van Oy would put it, Brigham. Yeah, Brigham. Uh, BYU gets a huge win over Utah State uh, for the wagon wheel. Uh, Friday night up in Logan. It feels like that game was two weeks ago. Uh, but there are real issues for BYU that we're going to get into here a minute. Obviously, the Baylor-Romney concussion, or excuse me, head injury. Uh, is significant. Uh, We told you on this show last week, and many of you mocked us, that Jaron Hall was not ready to go. And we found out Friday afternoon that Jaron didn't have range of motion and the coaching staff didn't feel comfortable making him a full participant in practice or putting him into the game. And that meant that Baylor Romney was going to play. And boy, he came out in that first half and he dominated the Aggies. And then he got hit, and he hit his head, and he was out of the game in concussion protocol. And in, in came Conover, and Jake, at that moment, it felt like it felt like the world was closing in on BYU. Yeah, there was daylight for Utah State. There was opportunity. The door had swung open a little bit um, as far as this game was concerned. And I, and I felt like, you know, BYU did a great job of just saying, we're, we're not going to let – this quarterback situation that we find ourselves in in the middle of this game uh, dictate the outcome. And, and that's what I was so impressed with. You know, you, you lose, you know, obviously Jaron was out, then you lose Baylor. Now you're on to Conover and you're basically just going the wrong direction, even though you have the lead. So what do you do? Oh, I don't, I don't know. You just stay nice and calm, cool, collected as usual on the sideline and start handing the football off. And then you run all over them, you know? And I thought that that was just a, a great sign of where this team is at mentally because it would have been easy to start stressing. You know, it would have been easy to start um, getting flustered and losing your composure and not staying disciplined, but that's not what they did. And this is why I continue to say this team is really well coached. And and I know that, that, you know, everybody knows about Kalani, but I think it's important that we give him credit when credit is due. And, and I feel like in this game, it was very much due because again, you could have freaked out. You could have gotten flustered and tried to do some things with Conover that he's not ready to do, but you didn't do that. You just handed it off to Algier, and you said, hey, we'll see you guys later. And and that, and that was all she wrote. And I just felt like 
that was a that was uh, impressive by by any measure. I know it's Utah State and not and not some you know powerhouse of a school, but but that was a tough game, and I, and I just think that this team continues to show uh, a lot of mental toughness, and and you know we'll we'll have to see just how far they can go without losing a game here. Yeah, I think that this is a critical stretch for BYU. Um, obviously, with what we saw from Baylor this weekend, there are some uh, opportunities for this team to really run the table, to head to USC, um, you know, or look forward to that USC game when you arrive there uh, undefeated. But if Baylor Romney is not healthy, I have real fears about this team's ability to beat Boise State because if Jaron Hall or Baylor Romney play, I think they're 10 points better than Boise State. I think Boise's a good football team. I think BYU's elite when their quarterbacks are healthy. Uh, we saw pretty good offensive line play. I think we saw, again, wide receivers with elite athletic ability. And the only question I have is their ability to execute this offense if Jacob Conover's in the game. And I just don't see that that's a possibility. Now, of course, if, if he's going to be the guy, he's going to have a week of preparation, and that's all well and good. This team needs Baylor Romney. And I've said this for two weeks now since he came in uh, to end the Arizona State game. I, in my opinion, I believe that Baylor Romney's the best quarterback for this team to win a national championship. If, if they were to get to a playoff and they were going to win a bowl game and they were going to win a playoff game, and he'd be the guy to take you there. I just don't think that Jaron Hall is the complete package that Baylor Romney is. Now, having said that, we're way ahead of ourselves here. You got to go ahead and beat Boise State, right? To do that, you better hope that Baylor Romney is good to go because if he has a concussion and he is unable to play in that game, I have real fears about their ability to win it because as we said on Friday, they are not convinced that Jaron Hall is ready to go. Ribs are a tricky thing, and everybody who's buying into this idea that, oh, it was just the, the win that got knocked out of Jaron, very clearly it's not. He was not able – um, to do all of the things he needed to do to show that he could be a full practice participant. And the, the verbiage that was used to me was range of motion. As a quarterback, if you don't have range of motion, you can't play the game of football. He, these two, you got to have one or the other. And if you're a BYU fan, Jake, I think Baylor Romney's the guy that, that I would be hoping would be under center against Boise State. Yeah, well, and I think that, you know, the, the thing with Baylor and, and, it, and it just is, uh, you know, for Jaron, it's unfortunate. But, you know, the thing with Baylor is, you know, the ability to pass in football, the ability to be a prolific passer is is significantly more valuable than the ability to be a prolific runner. And I think that, you know, Jaron has shown the ability to run and dominate a team on the ground, you know, and he's also shown that he can he can throw it a little bit, but not nearly to the level that that Baylor can. And I, and I think that. I, I'm not the one on the show who like who happens to like Baylor more than Jaron. I think that Jaron is a dynamic talent, but I do agree that when you start playing big time football and you start playing teams that have really good defenses and and you got to fit the ball into places, well, you're obviously going to go with the guy who has a better uh, uh, a better you know passing skill set. So to me, I agree with that, and I think that. This team um, needs to find a way to get one of these two healthy. I completely agree that they need one of these two. If Conover runs out there against Boise, you're not in good shape. You, you are, you are. That game's going to be really tight, and you're going to have to run the hell out of the ball. And I think, frankly, it's not just going to be Algier. Kato is going to have to get it going, you know. And and I think that's the one, the one thing that I'd like to see a little bit more out of. And it's not his fault per se. It's nobody's fault. I just think that Algier was so hot against Utah State. He was just like so, like I'm gonna take over this game mode, beast mode, basically. That I don't think uh, Kato got a chance really. You know, he I think he had like five five attempts or something like that. You know, it wasn't like he got a, a big workload. So yeah. if Conover runs out there, um, I think you should expect a heavy, heavy dose of of both of those two, and with a game plan to to facilitate running the ball a lot. Yeah, I, I, I feel like BYU's in a really good spot. I mean, I think what Algier showed you was that you can play different styles of football and still win a game. And I think one of the things that, you know, you bring out of this this game with Utah State, obviously the quarterback injury is a big deal. But what you bring out of it is that, wow, you have depth on this team. And I think one of the things that, you know, you always hear about BYU is, oh, well, they can't contend with the big boys because they're not deep and, 
you know, they're too deep, isn't deep enough. Well, you know what? In my opinion, I don't think that's an issue anymore. Um, you're playing three, four guys at just about every position on the line. Um, you look at defense, your linebackers can play. Now, the the one position on the field, obviously, that concerns you about BYU um, outside of the quarterback entries is the secondary. I think you you have some coverage issues when it comes to top-end speed. Um, Utah State showed a little bit that when you have flashy, you know, really fast guys, that they can take the top off of you. But what I also know is that you have two legitimate number one running backs. You have, you know, two legitimate number one quarterbacks. You have five deep wide receivers. You have an elite tight end. I mean, you, you, you're you able to mix and match. You had two huge losses on the offensive line. And I actually thought the offensive line held up quite well yeah. uh, against Utah State for not, especially without MP in there. Um, you know, I, I felt like you you held up pretty well. And again, I'm not, I don't mean to keep saying we told you so, but you knew going into this game that you weren't going to have a chance. I think you knew going into this game that you weren't going to have Jaron Hall, and you were still able to dominate the football game, even knowing that that you know we felt like Baylor Romney was going to be your guy. I'll just go to the I'll just go to the sheet. The locks on Friday we gave you thirty eight to twenty. It was thirty four to twenty. Yeah. So even without your your number ones all across the board, you still dominated Utah State. And with all due respect, Jake, to Utah State, I just don't think they're on the same level. Um, this was, relatively speaking, an easy win for BYU. Yeah. Well, and I, and, and I think that that is what what is um, you know that that's kind of what is going to hurt BYU's reputation this season. And I think this is also an important factor coming out of this Utah State win, which is, you know, all, you know, BYU Nation is all pissed off at that BYU isn't ranked higher than 10. And I think that when you look at their schedule versus the people that are in front of them, BYU's schedule hasn't been nearly as difficult as some of these other teams. And so I think I think the undefeated record record warrants you being a top 10 team. But who you play takes you up the top 10 ranks, you know. So, okay, you want BYU to be 8 or 9, let's say. Um, is their schedule tougher than the teams that are in front of them? So, when I look at Utah State, I say, yeah, you had some people out. But if you're a legit team, you're going to take care of Utah State. And that's exactly what they did. And, and, and we, we specifically talked about that on Friday, that if you have – if your team – is going through the portion of your season because every team does where you're injured and you're having to, you know, play with your depth guys instead of your starters. Every football team goes through that. And so this was BYU's time to go through that. And I'm happy, frankly, I'm happy it's happening now. Let's have this happen now, not at the end of the season because by the time no matter what, whether you're uh, uh an undefeated team or a one loss team, because I don't think there'll be a two loss team this year. But let's say that you did have the one loss heading to SC. That's still a massive game for your program. You still need to go to SC and win that game. So I'd rather you have those injuries now than at the end of the year trying to go and win a big big game at SC. Well, and the thing that I the thing that I would say if if you're a BYU fan that's upset about this ranking, and again I find it amazing that I flip on the tweet machine on Sunday two weeks in a row, two wins in a row. And BYU fans have fi are finding something to be upset about. It's going to go into crisis lockdown mode here at the house. I mean, it's remarkable to me that when you look at where BYU is, you're 10th in the country on October 3rd. When's the last time that happened? But why do you care that you're 10th in the country on October 3rd? Right? Like, you got a huge win. If you're a BYU fan, are you not thrilled that, that ASU beat UCLA? That's a huge win for you because it, it ticks up your strength of schedule. I, I think when you look at the AP top 25, by the way, who in this poll do you feel like you are that you're better than? Because I think this is this is a significant question if you're a BYU fan. Are you better than a 5-0 and Michigan? Well, you might be. I don't know. But the bottom line is they play in the Big Ten. Yeah. That's a, that is a conference that gets more respect than BYU as an independent. You, you're to me. Are you better than Oregon? You know, frankly, I think you are. But With Oregon, Baylor in the game, you're better. But but Oregon, by the way, has a win over Ohio State. Yeah, who is seventh, right? So, are you better than Ohio State? I don't think so. I think Ohio State's a massive football team. I don't think you're better than Oklahoma. I don't think you're better than Cincinnati, who is playing incredible football. They beat Notre Dame, as I told you they would over the weekend. 
Um, Penn State, Iowa, Georgia, and Alabama, you're not better than those four teams. Yeah. So I think 10th is exactly where this team belongs. And if you're one of the BYU fans that's complaining about this team not being, you know, 9-8-7, I, I, I think you're not paying attention to the rest of college football. I just think, Jake, this is exactly where they should be. Yeah, and, you know, when I hear teams like Michigan or Cincinnati or, you know, any any of that level of team, I do feel like this BYU team is as good as those particular programs. You know, I think right. I think if you take a 100% healthy Baylor-Romney-led offense and you put that offense against Michigan's defense, I think they're going to have success without a doubt. But I, but I also think that – that you know, there is a certain level you get to in college football, and this is why only some teams. Wait, wait, have, I'm sorry. Did you say this is why? Yes, this is why that only some teams have the expectation of getting to a national championship game because you got to have size, you got to have elite talent, and that's the biggest thing. I think BYU has, you know, Kalani's recruited his ass off. But at a certain point, you you get to a place where okay, you're still an independent, you're still BYU right now, so you 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 get limited on the talent you have. So yeah, are they as good as Michigan? Yes, in my opinion, they are as good as Michigan. Are they as good as Ohio State? No way, no way, no how, not going to happen. Oregon? Yeah. Yes, they're as good as Oregon in my opinion. I think they could hang with them. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of this season plays out because your big wins, so to speak. Um, I think largely come to an end in the next two weeks. I mean, bless the state gets a lot of respect in this country. Um, I think Baylor's an, is a good opponent, an incredibly disappointing performance out of the Baylor Bears over the weekend. Um, BYU should win these next two games. And if you do that, you're probably going to be top seven in the country. But think about it. Who's, who's BYU's big win? Ideally, it would have been Utah, but Utah has not been good. So now is that really a big win? I mean, Arizona State's a very nice win. Yeah, Arizona is. State, and you're is, right, especially after them beating UCLA. That's a, that, I mean, that really helps you. Arizona sure. State's a very nice win. I don't care what year or how you beat USC. If you go and and you you look back and you say, oh yeah, we beat we beat USC. We ran the table against the Pac-12. That's a those are <laughs> that's good. That's got wins. a nice ring to it, right? I mean, if you end this season undefeated, you're probably going to the playoff. I mean, you're gonna if if not, you're gonna be you're gonna be in a New Year's Six bowl. Yeah. And you're you're going to have a legitimate shot at the playoffs, and I think that's one of the things that that you're trying to do right now is position yourself to get there. But to do that, you and I know it sucks, and we all want to forecast ahead. But if you want to do that, you got to go one week at a time. That's what that's what this game requires. Let's get some of your thoughts in here. Dane says, "Morning, boys. What's up, Dane? Good to see you." Nye guy says, "Looks like ESPN needs needs to take that crown back from the Rams. Go Cards." <laughs> Secondary's playing well in Arizona. That defense is no longer an Achilles heel uh, for the Arizona Cardinals. Yep. We're going to talk NFL here coming up in just a bit. Greg Hawkins says, hello again, fellas. What's up, TV hello. star? Red Hot Teacher says, water is wet and Utah State injures another BYU quarterback, pretty much. Yep. Well, we told you that was going to happen. I mean, we, we, we Utah State plays with bad intentions, and whether it's a quarterback or – you know, uh, another, you know, important player. They're always out to get somebody from BYU. By the way, by the way. Yeah. By the MFing way. Right. Um, I would like to put this Baylor Romney isn't the starting quarterback thing to bet. Baylor Romney is your best quarterback. I think the, the K, I, I agree. But the chaos of this whoa, 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 whole situation. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Repeat what you just said. Yes, there. I agree that you right agree now that Baylor what? is the better quarterback. No. I hate it, but no, he is. That I'm good looking and I'm more intelligent. Okay, listen. So I was trying to pile on there. Hey, look at me. Anyway, the point is Baylor Romney's your best bet at quarterback right now. Yeah, and and it's I, – I wish Jaron was better, but, you know, it, it's it, this is the thing. It's not like Jaron Hall sucks. It's yes. not like Go Jacob on. Conover sucks, but, but Baylor has played better. It is what it is. The team's better. So you got to play him unless he's hurt. Man, I love you, dude. Yeah, Baylor Romney is uh, Baylor Romney is the right guy to start for this team. As I've been saying for weeks on end now. Okay, a week, not weeks on end. But when I say weeks on end, that sounds better. It gives me more credibility, oh, okay. I feel got like. it. Okay. Um, Horatio Hornblower says the offense just straight up more efficient, explosive, with Baylor, yes, please, In, indeed, expand on that. Good, I, good, good. I just wish you could somehow combine their skill sets, but that's Heisman territory. Yeah. Uh, Baylor Romney's more than mobile enough to get the job done. 
Um, but now you got to worry. Once you have a concussion, you worry about that next concussion because it's a, not a matter of, of if, it's when that next concussion shows up. Uh, CJ, good morning to you. He says, we will be fine. How about that defense holding USU to 22 yards of rushing, averaging over 200? People need to get over the fire tea crap. The fire tea crap. I don't know what fire tea crap is. Yes, it's more difficult than one P5 with Cincinnati. Uh, the Blind Swordsman DS says, I'm very grateful BYU is top 10. What pisses me off is BYU fans are like, BYU played bad defense. They gave up 22 rushing yards. Give me a break. Yeah, I... Of course, this is inaccurate. Yeah, I mean, it, listen, if you come out of a college football game and you didn't give up 21 points, it was a very good night. It was a very good night. Your defense pressured the quarterback. Your defense hit the quarterback. Your defense was in the backfield. Yeah. Your secondary, yes, your secondary has some issues. They can tighten that up. Um, but the secondary made plays. At the way Chaz IU is playing right now, how are you anything but thrilled with this defense? Listen, dude, I, they, they dominated up front on both sides of the football. And, it, and, and it's not to take anything away from guys like Chaz IU or the secondary or anything like that. But the fact of the matter is, is in football, when your defensive line is forcing the quarterback to roll out constantly and he's having to make throws on the run, your secondary is going to eat. I mean, yeah. that's, just, that's just how it is. And I, and I think that, you know, th this BYU defense, yeah, it does need some work. I agree with that. But they played damn well, dude. I mean, again, I don't care who you're playing. You 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 allow 22 rushing yards. Like, that's, that's domination. You know, you're forcing them to basically – pass only and when you can do that now this this prevent too high safety setup that they like to run works perfectly fine because now what are you doing you're forcing them to throw into the meteor defense and that's that's what you want yeah and i think again i'll just go back and say i think you're going to be fine no matter who the quarterback is including conover i think if if you had and I, what's the right way to say this if 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 you had been solely focused um, you know, on, on preparing, um, one quarterback. And if Jacob Conover had been the one quarterback that you were, you know, you know, concentrating on focused on all week, he'd have played a much better game. But when you throw a young man in, into that kind of situation, um, into a big game for one of the best teams in the country, of course, there's going to be nerves. So I actually think he did just fine. Five and nine, 45 yards, didn't turn the ball over. He did fine. Yeah, I don't think, though, that he's prepared to be a uh, – not that they're going to ask him to be a long-term solution, but but I don't like the prospect of Conover playing for, you know, let's just say hypothetically, what, you know, two or three weeks on, on the long end. Like, I like obviously, Jaron – I would expect Jaron to be back this week, but maybe not. Like, I don't know. They're kind of being – to be honest with you, like, I feel like they're kind of being a little coy about how bad this injury is. They're not really disclosing – you well, know. as you would assume. I mean, I mean, yes, yes, and no, though. Like, I feel Jake, like it's HIPAA. I know it's they, HIPAA. Be before I, they yeah. announce his injury, they need to do significant research on their own. I think that's HIPAA. You know? Yeah, I know. Significant research. Got to, got to see if it actually works. We don't know the long term side effects. I yeah. understand. I mean, and if you haven't called Andrew Wiggins, why not? Yeah. Do anyway, you want to set up the meeting? I'll stop. I'm being a jerk. The point is. <laughs> I think ribs are very difficult to diagnose and prognosticate. Well, I mean, unless you're smoking them, and then they're easy. Then that's, you know, you go to barbecue pit stop. But the point is, listen, listen. I think Jacob Conover would be a better player with a week of preparation. Yeah. All I'm saying is, I think you better hope and pray and tithe that Baylor Romney's back. Spinal. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I don't know if it's a spinal with... with well, your brain and your spine together and stuff. But the point is, um, I think it's pretty clear that that Baylor Romney is the guy that you need back there. And again, I think Jacob would be if if he's the guy. If that's who you got to roll with, he's got a week of preparation. He's to the get guy. There. He's the guy. He's our friend. That's love. Um, Zachary Thornton says, although I understand the hesitation with Conover, this guy was a record holder in Arizona, recruited and said no to Alabama. Focus reps changes everything. But the no to Alabama thing is a pretty frequent message. None of that matters anymore. Yes, he was a highly recruited quarterback, um, you know, but it, it's what you do when you get in the game. Like, and this is why Jackson Dart at USC is the, the, the perfect example. Jackson Dart said no to everybody else, and he got in the game, he threw the ball all over the field. Jacob Conover got in the game, and he didn't. He's just not ready. You know what I mean? Like, that's the... That's the thing that sometimes you just have to embrace that. Yeah. That, hey, maybe a rookie just isn't ready. 
And I think if you have a week of preparation in college, that allows you to get him ready. So I think they're going to be fine at quarterback. Uh, the night guy says it's called picking the fly shiz out of the pepper. Uh, okay. Okay. Sure. If BYU isn't injured, they are actually in the top four. They're not. No, no dude, they're not. No way. Jacob Alley. No, they're not. No, Jacob. they're not. Sorry, man. Tenth is perfect ranking for BYU when they're mostly healthy. They are a top ten team. Um, yeah, and I don't think you know. I don't think you. I don't. A. Why do you care? As long as they're top twelve, who cares, right? Because you just got to get in. Well, there's vanity in being the top ten. That's why fans care about it. Sure. But, I, but I think that. I think the biggest problem, honestly, I think when from like a rankings perspective, the biggest issue for BYU right now is they don't have the signature LSU win or the signature Ohio State win or like, you know, that big early season game win where you can hang your hat on that. You and know? this is the problem with the Pac-12 being crappy. Bad. I mean, it's <laughs> a it's a bad league this year. And I this isn't the Pac-12 feeding on itself. This is the pac 12s not very good. Yeah. I mean, the elites are not elite. I have no idea who the best team in this league is. I really don't. I thought for sure it was UCLA. And you got handled at home. And I know the Rose Bowl's almost no home field advantage. But still, But you got home, handled dude. at home by ASU, who is one of the most undisciplined football teams in the country at this point. And, and you just couldn't stop them. Um, Ninja Hipsta Flav. Uh, okay. Says, what up, boys? What's up, Ninja what's up, Hipsta man? Flav? Hello. Uh, Gabriel Kearney says, I'm a little disappointed that Baylor lost this weekend to Oklahoma State. That would have set up a big-time ranked matchup to strengthen BYU's resume. Exactly. exactly right. Exactly. Exactly right. Uh, Josh Levern says, they named Baylor Romney. Sounds like Mitt Romney and Art Bryles had a baby. <laughs> wow. Um, oh, hillbillies. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, that's a big Art Bryles. Uh, um, no, no, nope. Um, nope, not doing it. I mean, Jacob Ally says, I mean, uh, as long as we have Hall or Romney, it's fine. Okay. You know, Tanner Plummer says <laughs> a character win by BYU, losing your second string QB down multiple O linemen playing, um, a depleted secondary yet still took care of business. Exactly. Right. Yep. CJ says DC can't remember hit, um, how to spell you mean Tuiaki? You're talking about Tuiaki. Uh, can't remember how to spell his name ever. Yeah, I get that. Uh, also, uh, fire team means fire Tuiaki. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, right. Arizona winning and getting ranked again makes BYU look better. Truth. Um, Gabriel Kearney says, I think Malik Moore deserves more credit for how solid he's been for BYU's defense. I mean, that interception was, I mean, just the hands. Sensational. To make that interception were fabulous. Greg Hawkins says USC should hire Sean Payton. Well, we can I mean, how much further can we go without talking about Urban Meyer? Um, <laughs> Herbs. This herb is alert. ridiculous. We got an herb alert. <laughs> Did anybody see the video of Urban Meyer over the weekend? <laughs> so the Jags lose on Thursday night. They're 0 and 4. Well, Urban's back in Jacksonville preparing in any way, shape, or form, right? Like he's trying to get this team to do whatever he can do to win a game. <laughs> well, actually, he's not. He's in Columbus, Ohio at his bar. He owns a bar in Columbus. Um, and how do I put this delicately? Uh, because it's only 7.05 Mountain Time. Um, he was allowing a woman to grind on his hand. And it was not his wife. Um. And there's videos of it all over the place. There's pictures of drunk urban with college co-eds. That downstairs kitty cat is not yours to have, okay? And everyone's like, oh, he's trying to get fired by Jacksonville so he can get the USC job. If you felt these balls. Here's a, wow. Here's a question <laughs> for you. Stop it. Here's a question for you. If you're USC... If you are USC and you hear Jake playing drops like that, <laughs> and I'm I'm just curious, if you're USC and you know that this is a guy who has allowed domestic violence to flourish on his Ohio State staff, who had Aaron Hernandez, Rainey, all these other guys on his team at 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 Florida, 
And now he's allowing a college co-ed to grind on his hand at a bar where he's drunk. You know. And you're Carol Fult, the president at USC. This is the guy you're hiring? This is the guy. What, Lane Kiffin wasn't available? No, nah, he's still on a tarmac. Steve Sarkeesian's not available? You're not hiring Urban Meyer at USC. So even if he does get the air run out of Jacksonville, <laughs> USC's not hiring Urban Meyer now. That's over with. You're on tape cheating on your wife. You are on tape with a college age girl grinding on you at your bar. Yeah. While you're hammered drunk and you're married. Uh let's hire him. He he'll take care of our young that men. That seems like a good idea. He'll take care of our young men. He's a maker of men. Stop. Urban Meyer, and and I love that everybody is saying this, right? Like, oh, he's just trying to get fired from Jacksonville so he can go to USC. USC ain't hiring him. President Fult, there's no way she's hiring him. It's over. He is not getting the job at USC. Yeah. He's not. It's Sorry. not good, dude. And and, 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 and this has been going on. This conversation with Urban Meyer has been going on for decades at this point. And it's like, how long and how far can Urban push it until his character starts to matter? Because I'm, I'm, I've always been a firm believer, man. At some point, the the your character as as a man matters when you're trying to get a job, and yeah. and and I think you know whether we're talking about you know average Joe Schmo or Urban Meyer, and you can't just go out and do whatever you want to do. I don't even care the ramifications this has on his marriage. I don't care about that. He made that choice, but I I more care about about this whole conversation about hiring a guy like this. You can't just go and hire. Uh, anybody you want at USC. No. You're not Stony Brook, bro. I got news for you. You're USC. So, so yeah, I agree. Urban's out of this thing, for sure. I would agree with that. Uh, let's see. Greg Hawkins says USC should hire Sean Payton. Why would he leave? Yeah. Uh, Joshua Levin says, Daryl, Arizona would need to win out and look good doing it. Uh, James Knight says, can Boise State beat uh, BYU? Yeah, oh, sure they can. Let's figure out who the quarterback is. Um, I, it, to me, anyway. Um, Josh Levern says, Urban's wife was liking tweets that she deserves better than Urban. Truth, she was. She does. She was. Um, and I would agree. I would agree. Um, that I, I just, this, I, I, yeah. Makes me want to puke. It, it is, it is, um, I, I don't know, man. I don't know what you do. Uh, Nick Hines says, oh, man, Monty, those uh, Bears winning over the winless Lions might as well give Nagy the coach of the year exactly right. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Like, It's amazing what happens when uh, someone else is playing calls and they go down the field, huh? Dude, that's so frustrating. That is so frustrating. I just, yeah. Uh, Danny Lee says, Jaron Hall should still be the quarterback. He's the main reason they're ranked 10th right now. Well, no, Tyler Algier is why they're ranked 10th right now. Um, depth is why they're ranked 10th. And I would remind you that Baylor Romney came in and threw the rock all over the field against USF. Yeah, I just think it's the the total package that yeah. BYU is rolling out there. I, I don't think it's any one guy. I mean, Jaron Hall has played – I would – has Jaron Hall been elite at any point this season? I'm going to say he hasn't been. Um, Jaron Hall is a guy who lives on the five to seven yard throw. And then usually once a game, he will break you off with a big run, but their offense is far more explosive with Baylor Romney in the game. I mean, and the, the thing that a lot of people don't want to talk about is which one of these quarterbacks makes Tyler Algier a better running back. Yeah. Cause that's what you need. That very clearly is Baylor Romney. Yeah. Um, when you look at the ability to throw the ball outside the hash, um, and really when you look at the ability to throw the ball outside the numbers to the boundary, um, or throw from the opposite opposite hash, like that's there's that's no Baylor stern, Romney. Dude, there's no there's no stone left unturned on that field when he's at quarterback. You have to guard all you have to defend all the entire field, like yeah. north and south, east and west. The whole field is at your disposal when he's your quarterback. And I think that the tough part is, like, I really like Jaron. I do. I like the dual threat setup. I think you have to do it a specific way. I think you have yes. to execute it the right way. Yes. I like Jaron a lot. The problem is 
is that this is the age-old discussion. This is what we're seeing with Jimmy G in San Francisco. Your best uh, ability is your availability, and and it's really frustrating that that Jaron got hurt. But how did he get hurt? Remember how he got hurt. This isn't any kind of, you know, there's no confusion here. He got hurt running the football, and that's what you can't do as a dual-threat quarterback. You can't put yourself in compromising positions because when that happens – then the gunslinger and Baylor Romney comes in and you lose your job, which I firmly believe he has lost his job. Like, I, I just – how how is anybody going to say, okay, cool, what we've seen from Baylor versus what we've seen from Jaron, yeah, Jaron's my starter. How yeah, are you going to do and, that? And I, I think the more difficult thing here is if Jaron's not able to play against Boise State and you play Baylor Romney, if Baylor's able to play, yeah. um, and he continues to look good, I don't know how you come back for what then will be the biggest game of the year against Baylor, of which I would assume Jaron Hall would be ready to play. I, I don't know how you go back to Baylor or how you go back to Jaron over Baylor, especially knowing that Baylor Romney um, played really well against USF. He was dominating USU. Yeah. I think this is a big week for Baylor Romney. He really needs, if he wants to be the starting quarterback of this team, Going forward, Baylor Romney needs to play against Boise State. Yeah. Like, I mean, that is – that's really important. And I understand that you're looking at a situation where Jaron Hall lost his job through injury, but it doesn't matter. I'd remind you what happened when he got hurt. What did Baylor Romney do? Baylor Romney came in and threw an incredible touchdown pass um, to, to really salt away the ASU game. But again, I will say, what's best for the entirety of the football club? And to me, that is – whatever's best for Tyler Algier. Because when Algier is running well, this team is un- unbeatable. They are unbeatable. If Tyler Algier is going to drop 225 on, on Utah State, Utah State's not going to win that game. And I would also remind you, by the way, Utah State was never in danger of winning that game, ever. They were, they were never in position to say we're going to win this game. So my feeling is, is that if Jaron Hall were ready to play against Utah State, he'd have got the start. But he wasn't. And Baylor looked really good again. Yeah. And if Baylor Romney's healthy against uh, Boise State, if he's cleared to play, he's going to start. Um, I'd be really surprised if he didn't. I think at this point, it, it's really difficult. If all things are equal and everybody's healthy, it's very difficult to go back to Jaron Hall right now. Yeah, and I think if you're Kalani, you can't be worried about hurting feelings. Yeah. It, you know, feelings don't matter when you're, when you're looking at the win-loss column, right? Like, all that matters is – who gives us the best chance to win football games? And this is, it's funny, the Bears got brought up. This is what's so frustrating about the Bears situation, you know? Yeah. All they care about is feelings and not who gives them the best chance to win. Yeah, and I, I think I think Kalani's proven that he is not one that worries about his ego. He's worried about winning football games. And when you look at the way that they've built this offense, I think I think it's, it's, it's very clear. Your offense has more tools with Baylor Romney in the game. Correct. And I think when you look at, you know, look at what he's done for Puka Nakua. I mean, Baylor Romney has brought Puka Nakua into the season. Um, to me, I thought, you know, the first couple weeks of the season, Puka was a disappointment. I mean, the Nakua brothers really didn't get going until Baylor Romney came in. Well, what are you really saying, though? The offense didn't yes. get going with, yes. with when Jaron was in the well, game. Well, and how effective has Isaac Rex been as a, as a pass-catching tight end with Jaron Hall at quarterback? He hasn't really been effective. But yet when you have a guy that can throw all over the place and and can drop dimes, all of a sudden Isaac Rex is a force to be reckoned with. Got a huge first down against Utah State the other night. Like, you just start to look at the way this offense churns when Baylor Romney's in the game, and you start to look at the fact that Tyler Algier is now a 10, 12, 15, 20-yard run guy who has house potential every time he touches a ball – when Baylor Romney's in the game. But what happens when when you look at at Jaron in the game, everything's a lot lower to the line of scrimmage. Mm. The linebackers, the corners play more tight. The safeties. The safeties are two, three, four yards closer to the to the box. Because Jaron Hall is not the guy that's going to throw the ball 25, 30 yards down the field. You don't have to worry about that. What you have to worry about is the underneath game, and then when that's taken away, he's going to run. You, you can't do that. You actually push guys off the line of scrimmage yes. when Baylor Romney's your quarterback. So I just think I think there's a lot to look at there. Um, yeah, Jacob, I would agree with that. Algier all, literally is already an NFL draft. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. 
Jokes aside, I wonder if USC pursues Luke Fickle at since, if since he ends up in the college football playoff, Greg Hawkins says. Well, from what I understand, Luke Fickle is, has, has told Mike Bone that he is not going to leave Cincinnati at this point um, because he's built something. Beating Notre Dame for Cincinnati is a huge, huge moment. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, Brian Kelly, Cincinnati, that relationship, like beating Notre Dame is huge for Cincinnati. And if he gets Cincinnati to the college football playoff, I just don't see any way he can leave there. Um, and I think right now, today, at this moment, he's not available this offseason to take the USC job. Well, and if you're him, why would you leave? Yeah. Like, what is the, you know, what, do you want to start all over again? I mean, I I, I agree Cincinnati isn't USC branding-wise, but but Jesus, you're, what are they, uh, what, seven or eight in the country right now? Like, yes, you just beat, you know, Notre Dame. Like, everything is... Everything that he's been working his ass off for is starting to come to fruition. You know, you don't just leave that now, you know? So, so yeah, I, I, my personal opinion, and, and, and again, this is just opinion. This isn't like fact based or source based or anything, but my just opinion is that I think they'll have, they'll know who they're going to hire when the, when the end of the year gets here. That's my opinion. And, and then I think once, once the season officially comes to an end for them, when they play that last game, and you're doing that first media availability, then we're going to start to see some announcements. I, I don't think that they'll leave. I don't think there will be some deep, you know, coaching search into the offseason. I, I think they'll know who, they, who they're who they going to hire. Yeah, and I, and I think he just – I don't understand why these guys leave college. I, I, I just don't – not to continue to go back to Urban, but I look at Nick Saban. I mean, th- throughout the history of, Chip Kelly. of college football, Chip Kelly – why do these guys leave college football? I mean, you you are the king of your castle. At co- like Dabo Sweeney, Nick Saban, you look at the best coaches in college football, they all write their own ticket. They're all superstars. John Calipari going to the Nets all those years ago. What were you thinking? I mean, to me, you have it your way every day in college. I don't know why these guys would leave college. I, I It just, it's it's amazing to me. It is amazing. And there's me. very few who are successful doing it. I mean, you know, you look at Matt Rule, and, and he's, he's you know, done pretty well for himself so far. You know, Zach Taylor hasn't been too bad, but I think they've had a lot of injuries, and they've been a little disappointing. So, I don't know. I think when you're – when you're a Nick Saban level coach, like yeah, why like why wouldn't you just punch your own ticket every single year and just like enjoy life? No idea. <laughs> you know, Bruce Demand says maybe a slight difference between Utah ASU defenses in South Florida and Utah State. Well, I mean, so we're gonna we're gonna doubt Baylor Romney because of who he was able to play against. I, it's not about the defense, dude. Like when you the only the only thing the only thing you can hang your hat on with that is is the defensive line not being as big and as stout. The problem, though, with that argument is when Utah was good this year, early in the year, when they were still fresh, when they were playing good football, tragedy hadn't struck the program again, like you're not going through all this stuff, they dominated that that offensive or that defensive line. That offensive line protected them all day, and, and they ran right through it. So, so that's why I say, like, yes, I think there's a limit. Like, if you were to roll up and play – Alabama or Georgia yes. or like yes. any of the best, like clearly the best teams in the country. Well, yeah, your, your line is probably not better than their line. But, but the fact is, is like when I look at Cincinnati, Michigan, even Notre Dame, I think BYU could hang with those teams. But I also look at the way that, that Jaron played. I mean, you're talking about five, five yard touchdown pass, two yard touchdown pass. Like, and in the Utah game, he caught a touchdown pass. Like you're talking about, you're not talking about over the top chunk plays when you are BYU and you have a guy with the arm that Baylor Romney has, it doesn't matter who your defense is because your offense at that point is dictating to the defense. Yeah. And then when you can bring a hammer like Tyler Algier, I mean, you're, you're dictating the style of that defense. Dude, He tortured that Utah state secondary, like, like Tyler Algier, ran them over repeatedly. (laughs) It's impressive, dude. I don't care who you're playing. Like, that's impressive. He's a stud. I mean, he is absolutely a stud. And and I think when I when I go back to yeah, Tyler Algier's unbelievable. Needless to say though, the Baylor game that's coming up here in a couple weeks, was it two weeks now, I think it is, right? They they have Boise and then it's Baylor. 
when you you got to win the Baylor game. Like like yes, Boise is a threat, but assuming that they that that uh you know Romney's ready to go, that's a game that you really should win. And and then I I look at the Baylor game and I'm like, okay, if you get to that game six and zero and you're you're playing for your seventh win down there, like I I'm just sitting here saying, okay, you win the Baylor game and you go eight or seven and zero. You're now you're now there's no questioning that you're a, you have to be a top eight team because you're at that point you're seven and zero you just beat Baylor like you've got you've got momentum now so I just think that at the end of the day right now where the program is at get healthy and be ready to go for when Baylor gets here yeah let's switch gears and talk about the Pac-12 a little bit because I think this is a huge week up coming for Utah. Um, I don't know what to make of this conference. I really don't. Like it, it is stunning to me how mediocre Pac-12 football is. And I know that this year is a transition year for, for a lot of teams and a lot of coaches around the country. I mean, certainly if you look at what's going on, I mean, Alabama thumping Ole Miss. Um, you know, like it, you, th- this is a transition year. This is not a normal average year but it's a normal average year for the Pac-12. Like, this conference is not good right now. I look at what happened at the Rose Bowl, and it's shocking. I I am not surprised that Oregon went to Stanford and lost. Um, We even gave you that as a lock on Friday. That's still disappointing as hell, though. Well, I mean, it is, obviously, but the crystal balls, that's who that they're always going to be. Yeah. I look at UCLA, and I am stunned that their defense gave up 42 points to an undisciplined Arizona State team. And Before I, that game, what did you think of UCLA? What was your honest opinion? I thought they were the best team in the conference. Um, I And they may well still be. I don't know. Um, I think DTR is an incredible quarterback. Um, his, he, his dual threat skills were on full display um, against Arizona State. Um, you know, like it, it is – they ran for 200 yards and lost. I, like, I mean, it's It's unbelievable. Um, Charbonnet had 89 yards on 21 carries. Like they dominated the ground game yeah. and lost. And I just don't know how you explain how you gave up 42 points to what's been a, a good, not great Arizona state team. Um, and now you have, you have Utah going to USC who got a convincing, comfortable win, uh, over the weekend. Like I, I look at, I look at this conference, dude. I don't know who the best team is right now. Yeah, and I don't need like to be honest with you, man. I don't even think we should be asking that question because it doesn't really matter. Like, like who the best team in the Pac-12 is? They're all mediocre ass teams, honestly. Like, like look at it. You know, you look at even even UCLA. Like they have talent. DTR is a hell of a quarterback. Yeah. There's no question about that. You can't dispute that or get around it. He is a hell of a player. But but when I look at college football from a national perspective. And and you say to me, okay, um, Ole Miss. Let's use Ole Miss as an example. Hey, they just got their ass kicked by Alabama. A thorough and complete ass kicking by Alabama. Yeah. And I'll still take Ole Miss over any Pac-12 team this year. Like twice yeah. on Sunday, dude. Yeah. And that's the problem. And and it really is tough because it, you know, like with UCLA, they're one of the only stories in the Pac-12 right now. You know, you like going into that game. We were watching some of that game. And you would see it. You had made a great point. Hey, this is what Chip Kelly football looks like, and I agree with that. The problem is, <laughs> yeah, is they still lost the damn game. So I don't know how. I don't know what it's going to take for the Pac-12 to become, in my opinion, the right word is respectable. I don't know what it's going to take for the Pac-12 to become a, a a conference where, or you know, a league where you're like, okay, yeah, if I took if I took the best team in the Pac-12 and I match them up with the best team in the SEC, whether that's Alabama or Georgia, that's going to be a competitive game, not a 40-3 to three game. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I, this conference is just so damn mediocre. And I, it I, does impact BYU, like, big time. Yeah. It really impacts BYU a I lot. mean, you look at – yeah, I think this is a must win for Utah. I mean, obviously, you're coming off of an incredibly emotional two weeks of the bye – um, you know, the arrest in the air and low murder probably gives you some sort of closure um, to know that it looks like Aaron Lowe was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, it does not look like there were all kinds of wild rumors about gangs and drugs. And what was Aaron into? It looks like Aaron Lowe was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
um, and and he was murdered. And they arrested a guy this weekend for it. And you know, like it it, it gives you some bit of closure. Yeah. Now you got to go play a football game. And I know that we've talked about this a lot on this show with Kyle Whittingham, but USC always represents something special on your schedule. And Kyle Whittingham has, has not a matter of routine, but regularly beat USC. And so the question now becomes, what does this game actually mean? And really, I think maybe the bigger question is, what is Utah football really about? Is Utah football a program that expects to win national championships? Not right now. Is Utah football a program that you expect to win the Pac-12? Well, not right now. Like, I I don't know if, if Utah is an actual power player in college football. And I know that that sounds awfully harsh, but, you know, we've sat here and talked about Utah for going on years now. And we've always had expectations that have gone unmet. And so, you know, your your best produ- you know, predictor of future events is past activity. And Utah is consistently not produced in the biggest moments. Yeah. Whether that's losing to Colorado, whether that is, you know, just not in the moment executing in your biggest game, not beating Oregon when Kalen Clay drops the ball on the one yard line. Kalen Clay. You know, like Jesus. you you but I mean, those are moments that will live in infamy because you had Oregon on the ropes at Rice Eccles Stadium. And the struggle for me is I think you have to come around to the fact that these are end times for Kyle Whittingham at Utah. I mean, we are watching the end of an era of Utah football. And, it, you know, it was put to me over the weekend on Friday that maybe this is a good thing. I don't know. I think Utah football is probably maxed out under Kyle Whittingham. Does he need to go? I don't think he needs to go. Is it a bad, bad thing? Is the world going to end? It's not. A year from now, the Utes will still be playing football, right? But Kyle Whittingham has been a very, very good coach for Utah. But I don't know. Are they national championship quality? Are they conference championship quality under Kyle Whittingham? Uh, They were in 2019, yeah. They were, and I think that I think that um, a lot's happened since then, and I think it's changed Kyle Whittingham. I, I think when you have, um, no matter how it happens, you know, when you lose two players the way he's lost two players, yeah. when you don't get to the college football playoff and you miss it by one game, uh, because let's be honest, that would have been the pinnacle of his career uh, at Utah, making the college football playoff. Um, you know, like I, I think it's just been a rough couple of years. And I think that, you know, when you face all that adversity, it really starts, it makes you question who you are as a man. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, uh, think about it. Kyle Whittingham, like, feels responsible for the kids in his program every single year, year yeah. after year. And yep. I think it just is, it's very impactful. And so is it good for the program that are watching the end of Kyle Whittingham? No, I don't think it's good for the program. Is it, it does he need to leave? No, I don't think he needs to leave. I, I think this is different than that. I think this is, this is a, a, one of the best head coaches, uh, really one of the best maker of men that this state, like I'm talking about the state of Utah has ever had. And I think anytime you lose a figure like that, <sighs> It's, it's going to be tough to replace. So I don't even think we should talk about, hey, is this good or bad for the program? I think we need to start talking about, okay, how does he get sent off? At, like, is it handled the right way? Those are the conversations we should be having. Yeah. I mean, anyway, the, the Kyle Whittingham era, when it comes to an end this year, next year, in 10 years, it's going to be tough to say goodbye. Yeah. Um, and he is, he is due respect. There's no doubt. But – if Kyle Winningham's going to be the head coach at Utah, they need a quarterback that can throw the football. Um, I mean, this stuff, you know, you had a quarterback quit the team after getting pulled. Like. And I think that's just such a question mark for fans. Why did he quit the team? Was there an issue in the program? Like, there's all these questions surrounding that. And my guess is it's as simple as Charlie Brewer just wanted a place where he could go and play. It's as simple as Charlie Brewer's week. Yeah. That's what this is. Yeah. And so, but this has been the problem for a decade at Utah is you don't have a prolific passing game, so you can't recruit quarterbacks. What you need is, again, and my guy will be Chris Peterson if, if Kyle Whittingham retires, but yeah. 
you need somebody that can record, re, um, recruit quarterbacks and wide receivers. That's what you need because this program's struggling. And the identity of this program as a defense-first program is its, is its weapon and its weakness all in the same time. Now, having said that, USC is going to get a lot better when they hire a coach. And my feeling is, is that this conference is going to rebound. Yeah. I don't know when I would hope that it would be next season because it is tough to watch Pac-12 football when they play like this. It's tough to watch Pac-12 football I mean, when you can actually watch Pac-12 football. Yeah. Just well, putting that out there. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. It's interesting. I just, I'm so disappointed UCLA lost that game. It's so disappointing. Yeah. It's rough. Um, Star Lomanu says, um, CJ, I meant he and other coaches would have options. Defensive resume building back-to-back seasons. Uh, okay, I missed your original comment. Larry Pilgrim says, Baylor looked like crap versus a team that scored zero points against Boise. Who were, who would you be referring to? When does Baylor look like crap? Baylor Romney's never looked like crap. Baylor Romney. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're talking you're... about If you're talking about Utah State, Baylor Romney, I – played really good football Friday night. I don't know what game you were watching. He's 15 of 19, 187 yards um, and a touchdown. What did you want him to do? What yeah. more could he have done than that? I, I don't know. He took a couple of big hits. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know what more you would want Baylor Romney to do. He did not look bad against Boise I have, or against Utah State. I have no idea what you're talking about there. Um, Greg Hawkins says, how about Oregon State, though? Cool for them so far. They're playing good football. And it's such a weird year, right? I mean, we're talking about UCLA losing at home and Oregon losing against Stanford and, you know, Oregon State being good. Like, what are we doing? Like, where is this conference at right now, you know? Larry Pilgrim says, Hero DTR showed up and he didn't see wide receivers, uh, open receivers. I think DTR lost confidence in his receivers. There was a there were a couple of drops. He didn't want to throw the ball in the tight coverage. I they were run well, and the other thing is they were running all over Arizona State. Like they were running whenever they felt like it. Um, I think some of their damage was play calling too, by the way. Uh BYU Pac 12 South Champs, Jacob says. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but I mean BYU, he, he, here's the thing though. BYU's won a lot of games at home. And with all due respect to the Aggies. Logan's not exactly some amazing home hey, field advantage. it's 25,000 people. Well, and they move the fan section. Come on. Like, it's not like, with all due respect, Maverick Stadium's not some great home field advantage. Yeah. So my feeling is is that when you go to, to David Koresh country. David to, Koresh. David Koresh. You go down to Waco, now you're playing on the road. Yeah. Let, let's see what, you know, let's see what. BYU looks like in a hostile environment like Waco, Texas, because that's a huge football game for them. Huge. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. Uh, Star Lomanu says, uh, LOL, Lane Kiffin is the new meme. Lane Kiffin's not going back to USC. I mean, I know that Keyshawn Johnson on ESPN 710 LA had said that if Old Miss beats Alabama, that Lane Kiffin would be the lead candidate at USC. Again, I just think that sells very short what USC is looking for. USC has been very clear. They're not looking to go backward. They're not looking into the past. They're looking forward. Yeah. And by the way, that whole, if Lane Kiffin beats Alabama thing, how'd that work out for you? Not well, Bill O'Brien with a hell of an offensive Bro, game plan. I'm talking about ass beating dude. <laughs> like that's Alabama football. You want, That's a guy that's a candidate. I'm telling you, Bill O'Brien, the offensive coordinator at Alabama. Roll Tide. That's a that's a head coaching candidate next year. Yeah. Mark my words on that. Roy Wall says the coaches need to get Hall on the field because of his athleticism, but QB is only one position he can play because he's fragile. Romney is the better QB, and that's the other thing you got to you know I mean Fragile's a little rough. Well, I'm not ready but to call him fragile. Jaron Hall's gotten two chances to start, and both times he's gotten hurt. Well, but again, he's getting hurt because he's making bad decisions in terms of how far to push the running game. That's yeah, he, his issue. The Arizona State injury was 
in my opinion, he should have gotten down much earlier. Yeah, I mean, you, it's not like the guy is a is a glass football player. I I, well, I think that I he, don't know though. You say he certainly. I think you could say Jaron Hall is injury prone. No, Jaron Hall is he's not injury prone. He is he is prone to making dumbass decisions that lead to big hits. That's what he's prone to. Okay. Well, and I think if he would make better decisions, this is this is the same thing we talked about with you know RG three in the NFL. Oh, you didn't have a long NFL career. Well, why was that? Because you were taking hits constantly. I mean, that's what these guys have to figure out. And again, to be clear, I'm agreeing with you. Baylor should be the guy that leads this team right now. I don't even think this is a discussion. You're you're heading to Boise, then you're then you're then you're Baylor. Like you got to win these games. How often, if you're Kalani Sataki, are you going to be five and zero heading into the to the second quarter of the season? I mean, come on. How dude. long? How many times, if you're BYU as an independent, have you wanted a seat at the table? Well, you got one. And so now you got to keep winning. And games. by the way, the clock's ticking. You're not you're not going to be an independent anymore. So the whole hey, can BYU get to the college football playoff as an independent conversation? That window is closing. So that's why I say this year you, you don't have time for games. With all due respect to Jaron Hall, you ain't got time. Yeah, uh, Greg Hawkins says the Pac-12 would solve so many of its own problems by winning. Hard to see how to get there the way things are going right now. Well, and your scheduling is not helping you. Your TV deal sucks. Your streaming deal sucks. Like it just you, the the conference has got to completely change, and that's not something you can do over a year. It's going to take time. Um, you know, it, it'll be, you know, yeah, it'll be interesting. My favorite part of being at the USU game was the USU students chanting "overrated" towards BYU. Yeah. Well, also by the way, um, I thought it was funny that they were talking about how USU was chanting. Block that kick. Block that kick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and again, I know that there were a bunch of people that were pissed I said it. <laughs> Utah State fan is an ornery fan. <laughs> but listen, you're playing, it's a scrimmage. That's the best way I can say it. Is there anybody, I've watched every snap of that game. Yeah. USU was never in danger of winning that game. They were ne- and I and I didn't misspeak. Yeah. Utah State was <laughs> never in danger of winning that game. That game was over before they even kicked it off. Yeah. Right? You lose Baylor Romney and you bring in Jer- uh Jacob Conover and you were still never in position to win the game. I mean, it just it you're not good enough. You're not well coached enough. Your coach is emotional and melting down on the sidelines. Like, what are you doing? Right? Like, I could get out of here. It, it is what it is. Um, Leonard uh, Piaxado, watching from Brazil. Nice podcast. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks for watching, bro. Leo Duran says, I used to attend Baylor games with our family uh, when our family lived in Waco, and the road environment is nothing compared to the hostile environment like the University of Texas, RES, et cetera, where I've attended games. Well, I, I, I will continue to say, having been at full stadiums at Notre Dame is intimidating. Um, Rice Eccles Stadium is one of the best home field advantages in all of college football. Which is, you know what, which is, I know we're, I know we're past this now, but that's the other shame in the whole Utah thing we were talking about, too. Utah football to this community, it, you know, in Salt Lake, not, not obviously not down in Provo, but in Salt Lake, Utah football is like, is the lifeblood of this community this time of year. And I think that that's the real shame in the whole thing. Instead of talking yeah. about, Hey man, you want to go to the Utah game? You want to go and, you know, get, get in there while the getting's good. We're talking about people dying out here, man. Like that's what we're talking about. And now we're going to talk about wit, not being the coach anymore. And you know, we got to talk about, Oh, is he not capable anymore? Like that's the whole shame in it. You know, that that's really what, what sucks about the whole thing. Like it just is, it's not what any of us needed, especially coming off the pandemic. Not that we're fully out of it, but coming off of it, like we didn't need another Utah football player dying. We didn't need Utah not being good. We, Frankly, it was awesome that Utah lost the Holy War, but then things have kind of spiraled out, out of control after the San Diego State game, and we didn't need that. And, and that's really what the shame of the whole thing is. Oh, wow. Yowzer. Numerous Snow College football players um, posted on Twitter early Monday morning expressing their condolences for a player killed in a car accident. A freshman offensive lineman. They, this Wait, where, where it, is this? For Snow College. Wow, that's brutal. 
Um, a snow, uh, snow College has confirmed one of its players died in a single vehicle crash uh, on 100 you see what I mean? on Sunday night. You see what I mean? What are we talking about? Wow. Man, this season is just big. Right? Like, what are we talking about? We're not talking about, we're, we're not talking about, hey, you know, is, is Utah going to win the South? We're we're not talking about them, you know, them going to SC and kicking the sh- crap out of out of USC. That's not what we're talking about, and that's that's wow. what's really sad. We're talking about gun violence and people dying in car accidents. This is crazy, um, boy. I'm sorry to hear that. Snow College, the Snow College community, um, boy, we wish you well. That's that's rough. I mean, this is just this season. Just it just keeps going, man. It is, and that's why I say, like, you have to, you just have to appreciate every day because nothing's guaranteed. What a bummer. What a bummer. Sorry to hear that for uh, our friends at Snow College. Such a good program, too. Good folks uh, down at Snow. Um, I mean, this, and you thought last year was was rough. Jeez. Um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what Utah does here. I really don't. All right, let's switch gears, talk NFL uh, I am amazed. I am amazed at the performance that we are getting every Sunday night. And Tom Brady <laughs> versus Bill Belichick was awesome last night. Lived up to it. It really did. And, you know, the storylines away from football, obviously with Folk missing the game-winning field goal, you know, Tom Brady, uh, the hero versus Bill Belichick, the villain. <laughs> you know, the good guy wins. Like, everything was cool. The best part of that game, though, was before um, before the game on Saturday, Bill Belichick texted Tom Brady and said, hey, let's spend some time together after the game. And so after the game, they sat in the Tampa locker room and just talked and just spent some time together for about 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I like football. I like football season and all the things that go with it. And I thought that was very needed closure. Because what I thought was good, too, was after that, Tom Brady came out and said, well, you know, you guys all assume that we had a bad relationship, and we don't. Those are narratives that you guys have written. And I think that's what was needed. I, 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 it always bothered me to believe that Tom Brady and Bill Belichick had some kind of falling out, and their time was just over. And you know what? Tom didn't play well last night. They still wound up winning the game. Yeah, and I thought that was a huge win. I think it it probably reinstalls um, Tampa is is one of the best teams in the NFL. I just think it's classic Tom Brady. No yeah. matter no matter what he's dealing with, he's down twenty eight to three. It's raining and he's down two points. Like you know, it's it's classic Tom Brady. I don't even who, how many people even care that he's now the all time record holder for passing yards, and that yeah. Drew Brees was there watching it happen. Like I don't think anybody cares about that. I I, I think I think everybody. I think we love a good interpersonal rivalry in professional sports. We yeah. love that. And 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 you're right. Like the the media did write those stories, but I think there's also no doubting that when you have two guys who are competitive as these two are, they're going when they were on the same team together, they're going to have moments. They are. That's the nature of the beast. But to say that they hate each other is just ridiculous. Yeah, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel right. But man, I, I just feel like that was a huge game. Um the Arizona Cardinals are arguably the best team in the NFL right now. And verticality is playing good football. I mean, if you look at uh, the way that this offense for the Arizona Cardinals is going, and if you look at Kyler Murray, you look at Cliffy, I mean, it Cliffy. seems like it seems <laughs> like everything's coming together. And the reason it's coming together is because Drunky the Clown, um, their general manager, Steve Kime, has finally put enough talent on the field. A.J. Green's healthy. Using, you know, being the big body wide receiver they needed. Um, I, I think this team, their defense is their secondary has gotten much better. Mm-hmm. This is a very good football team. I think you could make the argument the Arizona Cardinals are the best team in the NFL. Yeah. And, and I think it all stems from that defensive line. I mean, I, you, you know, you look at Chandler Jones and you look at JJ Watt, and, and, and I look at the Byron Murphy interception yesterday, and, and I say that whole interception was built off the fact that there was pressure in Matthew Stafford's face and yeah. he was forced to throw the football. And I think that. This is yesterday was a statement. There's no there's no getting around it. I mean, if you've been following this show for, I don't know what, the last five years, maybe, you know, you know that on the radio in Phoenix, we talked all about how how this team was not good enough, that this team was 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 not getting the job done, that this team, you know, was an underachiever. Now, 
um, as it sits right here today, they are going to contend for the NFC. I have no doubt about that. The question's simply going to be, are they going to win their division or are they going to have to go the wild card route? And right now, they're looking pretty mm. good for that division because I did not like what I saw the 49ers yesterday at all. Well, and I, it was shocking that the Rams just, I mean, I don't know. That, like, I, I, that's not the defense that we'd all gotten used to in L.A. And I think a lot of that is that people are having trouble dealing with the speed that the Arizona Cardinals bring to the field. And I also think that Kyler Murray is able to throw past defenses now, which he wasn't able to do last year. Yeah. Um, and when he throws for 268 yards, two scores, no, no interceptions – that's pretty. That's pretty and what, impressive. What was it? What were the attempts? Attempts versus you know twenty four thirty two. So I he mean, was he, efficient. Yeah, I mean he's he, he and and to me what that really says is he trusts the guys he's throwing the football to. I mean look no further than the AJ Green touchdown. I mean that's a yeah. that's a back foot throw where he you know just kind of slings it up there, trusting he'll catch it. Well, and the Arizona Cardinals needed to go all in on the pass game, right? I mean because you you were David Johnson this and. You know, like you're trying to run the football, and I, I understand that, that you got to run the football, and they still did 40 times, but you, it's Kyler Murray by design. I mean, in, in it's nice that Chase Edmonds gives you 120 yards. I think this <laughs> offense goes the way that, that verticality goes. When Kyler Murray plays well, they win. Bro, if you're getting 120 out of Chase Edmonds, they're winning every night. Yeah, I mean, which is why I'm know, saying it's shocking like, he did that against the yeah, Rams. Dude, I mean, Look at you. Yeah, oh, like, I mean <laughs> – I, 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 well, nobody's wondering who, who they are anymore, that's for sure. And then I look at the Dallas Cowboys, and I say to myself, Dak Prescott's an MVP candidate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this guy is is playing incredible football, 26 of 39. Um, or, excuse me, 14 of 22, 188 yards and four scores. Four. Um, four scores. Dude. Uh, against Carolina, that's not exactly a pushover defense, like, and the other thing, and you've talked about this a lot, I know, but Ezekiel Elliott, 20 for 143 yards, 7.2 yards a carry against Carolina. I mean, the Dallas Cowboys are playing awfully good football, and that's a team to be reckoned with. They're 3-1, they're and one, and I think Dak Prescott's an MVP candidate. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think, you know, in past years, you know, you look at this Cowboys team, and, and what do we talk about? Well, they got Dak, right? And, and then last year it was, well, where's Zeke? Well, now they got Zeke. Okay, well, where's Amari? Well, they got Amari, right? And now I think the thing that's taking them to that next high level is the defense. I mean, again, take this Cowboy team and compare them to the Chiefs right now. What are we missing out of the Chiefs? Well, we're missing the fact that they're not playing good defense and they're not they're that offense is just not humming the way it usually does. And so I bring the Chiefs up because they're a team that traditionally has been like the total package. Check every box. Yes. You know, you've got Tyron Matthew, Chase Sorensen, like you've got all these thumpers in the secondary, and and that's exactly what I'm seeing in in Dallas. I'm seeing a lot of turnovers created by that defense, so they're getting off the field and they're giving Dak Prescott more chances to push the ball down the field, which is ultimately what this league is about: scoring touchdowns consistently. But when you're talking about the National Football League MVP, I mean, you got to talk about Zach Wilson, though. Anyway, I'll stop. Uh, how about the Jets getting win and Zach Wilson looking <laughs> fabulous doing it? Um, I mean, it, it, this is rookies in the NFL. Yeah. One week you look like you're incompetent and you have no business uh, playing football in the NFL, and then the next week you come out and you throw the football all over the yard, uh, and the Jets wind up beating what has so far been a very disappointing Tennessee Titan team. And Zach Wilson looked good throwing the football. And, and I'll say the same thing this week that I said last week when he looked terrible. He's a rookie. He's going to look great. He's going to look terrible. And next week, he's probably going to look terrible again. Yeah. I mean, that's just the plight. But you're on a terrible football team with the Jets. And Zach Wilson absolutely is the reason they they won the game. They couldn't run the ball a lick. And he threw the ball all over the place. Him and Keelan Cole seem to really have chemistry. I mean, Corey Davis is a, you know, is a fantastic wide receiver. But Zach Wilson and Keelan Cole seem to have real chemistry. And for me, anyway, I felt like this was a breakout game for for Zach Wilson's confidence. I mean, I think it. it, it I'm not going to go as far as to say that it validates what the Jets did when they took him at that point, but he played really good football yesterday. Yeah, and and I think the the biggest thing is for the Jets right now, it's not even whether they win or lose. It's it's how the game goes, and and you know, did you did you compete and were you there? 
when you needed to be. And I, and I think Zach was. And I think that everybody who's saying, oh, Zach's a bust and he's not good, I, I think you're just way too far ahead of that train. I mean, yes. I'll take Zach Wilson ahead of Trevor Lawrence all day and twice on Sunday, and we've been having that conversation since the draft. And and I think yeah. that Zach is, Zach is a guy who is extremely cerebral. Zach is a guy who leads this football team and understands that you're not going to win a, a championship right now. You got to build this thing. And, and what we saw to him yesterday was really impressive. I'm talking about th- those are, you don't see those kind of throws in the college game. Let's put it that way. That is an NFL only situation. And he crushed that. And I thought, I, I think it does validate what the Jets did. I, I, I think that it does. Yeah. Well, I also think when you look at Zach Wilson as a quarterback, this is a guy that had to win games for BYU last year. He has to win games for the Jets this year because they don't have another route to go. So for my money, I I think this is really good Zach Wilson. And speaking of rookies, I think we saw the best we've seen out of Justin Fields as well yesterday. As Meyer and we, the Chicago Bears of Arlington Heights. By the way, you hung the flag out yesterday in front of the house and it looked pretty damn good, did it not? And they won. Um, Just saying. Yeah, Justin Fields, 11-17, 209. Did throw the interception. Um, you know, obviously the big story is David Montgomery's knee injury for the Chicago mm-hmm. Bears, but it looks like that's a hyperextension. Not they they don't believe that there are any ligaments compromised, um, which is which is good. But I mean, that's why you signed Damian Williams. Uh, but I, I mean, obviously the the other part of this is that you got a you got a big performance again out of Roquan Smith, who's turning into one of the best linebackers in the NFL. Uh, I think you look at the way that Robert Quinn is playing. He's finally healthy and back to 100%. Um, getting after that quarterback. Eh. Quarterback. So it lessens the blow of that bust Khalil Mack. <laughs> one tackle, one sack. Thanks for coming. Like, hmm. the Bears have all kinds of systemic issues. Yeah. One of them is Khalil Mack's hurt. Um, the other is that Hicks just can't stay healthy on the Bears' defensive line. And he is – Akeem Hicks is just such a huge part of what they do. Yeah. I mean, the Bears are a poorly run football operation because they're not run by football people. Moving the team out of the city of Chicago, huge mistake. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, they and if you didn't hear, the Bears bought land at uh, that used to be the home of a racetrack called Arlington Park, uh, a horse racing track. They bought the land there, and they are likely going to build a new stadium there. It's, it's not the best situation, and we all know that. What is it, 40 minutes outside of the city at least on a good day? Well, it's just a different vibe. I mean, you're not in downtown. You're not in the heart of 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 the city. Yeah, and look, I get it. The 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 Jets, you know, and Giants play in, in New Jersey. Totally understand that. Uh, you know, the New England Patriots don't play in Boston. They play in Foxborough. Totally get that. The Arizona Cardinals play in Glendale. They don't play in Phoenix. I get it, but I, this I don't is the like Chicago it, dude. fucking Bears. Like this is a team that plays on the lakefront in downtown Chicago yeah. or used to, and now they're going to wind up building a football palace, and I'm sure it'll be beautiful. In and it's Arlington probably Heights. needed. I mean, I get it, but yeah, I just I don't know. I, I it, it that is a to me that screams of like a a P and L move, a, a profit and loss statement move, where you're saying okay. We want to get out of downtown. We want to save some money, not having to, you know, pay the downtown pricing, and we're we're going to move out to more open land, and that's fine and everything. But I'm telling you, at some point, the the Chicago Bears will be good again at some point. I don't know that that's anytime soon, but it's just unfortunate that that's not going to be at at, at Soldier Field. That's what's unfortunate. Yeah. Hey, a little breaking news for you, by the way, uh, Tim Bontemps. Uh, is reporting the NBA and the NBA PA have agreed to a reduction in pay uh, of a player's salary for each game an unvaccinated player misses in their home market because of local laws. Mm. For example, Kyrie Irving would lose roughly $381,000 a game because he is not vaccinated. So now it is legislated between the NBA and the NBA PA that if a player can't play games, he's going to get back a game check. Yeah. So this is pretty. Um, and remember, Kyrie's part of that process through and through. Remember that. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Um, I think it is. This is going to get ugly. The season's here. We watched um, Anthony Davis looks remarkably trimmer, mm-hmm. shockingly thinner. 
Anthony Davis looks like he spent an offseason getting ready to play basketball. Uh, by the way, Jazz play tonight. Yes, they do. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure many people know that. Um, are you at all worried about Boyan Bogdanovich and Rudy Gay missing time? Rudy Gay, not so much, but Boyan Bogdanovich has already got a sore, sore shoulder. Yeah, I mean, if it's not his wrist, it's his shoulder, right? So, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that, that Boyan is a unreliable player. I think that he, if anything, he's shown you he can play through injury, but I think that at some point you got to be 100%. And I, and I think, again, not, not that we're going to do 20 minutes on the Jazz here, but, you know, just when you think about the Jazz, just remember, last season the struggle was, hey, when Don and Mike are on the floor, Boyan doesn't get the ball. That's a problem. So when Boyan's mm-hmm. not on the floor, who's getting who's getting the ball? Well, I think you know you, you know who's getting the ball. It's going to be Rudy or or Mike or Don, and that's as simple as it is. So we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it could just be shooting soreness. Who the hell knows? But he's got to get that figured out. They have to stay healthy. I mean, um, you know, and now especially knowing that Rudy Gay is going to miss the start of the season with this heel surgery thing, like. I mean, that's a major injury for this team. And it's not ideal. And by the way, everybody, a lot of Jazz fans enjoy cracking how old the Lakers are. This is not a young roster Yeah, that the Jazz have. Yeah. So. And by the way, the Lakers depth looked pretty damn good the other day. Just saying. And I don't know how you know this, but your feet are important. And if you have a bum heel, that's not a great way to play basketball. Yeah. So the preseason is largely tune-up. You know, you just want to see guys get in. I, I don't know. Are you playing Donovan Mitchell tonight? Are you? Oh yeah, yeah. They'll get they'll get like fifteen minutes. Yeah, I'd absolutely load manage this team from the very first bounce of the basketball in preseason. Yeah. To the end to the end of the regular season. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of your you know your your you know your young players and and your depth guys are going to get the the lion's share of the minutes in the preseason, no doubt. You know, I think that um, I want to see Butler knocking down threes. I want to see. You know these other guys. I want to see Pascal, you know, getting it done in the in the mid to high post. You know, I want to see you know uh, Hassan Whiteside, you know, doing some things defensively. So that's I, I I honestly think you know the the starters will get 15 minutes. I wouldn't think much more than that, and you'll see the depth guys in the rest of the way. That's what I think. I just don't see a whole lot of value in playing Mike Conley. I don't see a whole lot of value in playing Don. You know, like later in the preseason, I'm all about that. I just think when when you look at the way this league is being built and you look at the Brooklyn Nets, the L.A. Lakers, you look at these guys and you just start to realize that the best teams are not going to overload their, their guys at any point in time because there's just no value in it. Yeah. And this is the conversation about that we had last week. Yeah. Do the Utah Jazz need to focus on having the best record in the NBA? No. And I tell you, absolutely, they do not. Even if they were, they, they wouldn't do, do it. They wouldn't do it because they're not that team. I don't know. I think there's a lot of people who would who would who would buy that bag of burning crap on your doorstep that says the Jazz need to uh, win the best record in the league. Yeah, but my my thing, and that, that that might be very true, but my biggest thing here is if you're a Jazz fan, remember what's happened here in this offseason that you have not been able to see because it happens behind the scenes. Everybody else around the Jazz got better, right? Like yeah, significantly better. I would agree better. with that. And yeah. I think that everybody around the Jazz is healthy now. You don't have a bum Laker team. You don't have a bum Nuggets team. You don't have... Um, you know, any of these teams that just aren't capable of competing with you now. You're you're playing against fully healthy, ready to go, ready to 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 mess with you teams. And I think that you have to understand that when that's the case in the Western Conference, the Jazz are not the best team in the Western Conference when that's the case. Yeah, and I think this is a big preseason for Eric Paschal. I mean, this is a guy who's gotta show you where he fits into your offense. Yeah. I mean, he's here because he's friends with Donovan Mitchell. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But he's a very capable performer. And Pascal's a guy that's going to have to play some 3-4-5. Um, he's a guy that's going to have to create for himself, I think. Um, and it'll be interesting. I want to see Hassan Whiteside as well. Yeah. Uh, I want to see what Hassan looks like. Obviously, Jared Butler. Like, I need the rotational guys to be more than rotational guys. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, they, they need to carry the load through the preseason. But... Um, I'm not somebody that, in my opinion, it, it, how do I say this tactfully? I'm not somebody who's ever going to advocate for risking somebody's health in the NBA. I'm not, especially when you have an injury history like you have with, you know, Rudy Gay's an older player now. 
and he's going to miss the start of the season with heel surgery. That's terrifying to me because if Rudy Gay isn't 100% at any point in this season, you're probably not doing much. Yep. He is really important to this team. So that'll be interesting to watch. Um, do you guys think this is a championship year for the Jazz? I don't. No, they will not win a championship, in my opinion, with Rudy Gobert on the roster. I don't. When he's your number one center, I just I think his contract and I think his limitations, until he shows me he's not limited anymore, which is to say, show me you can dribble, show me you can shoot a baby hook or do something other than dunk, that's when I'm going to look at Rudy Gobert and say, okay, well, maybe my opinion's changed. But I, this is, let's, we, and we tend to as fans to default to, well, this is our year. It's not your year. It, it's never your year, right? I mean, it is just get through the season healthy. Then when we get to May, let's say, hey, is this a championship team? Because that's when you're going to answer that question. So it is what it is. Yeah. There you go. Jazz need to keep stars healthy, Marilyn says. Would agree with that. Utah have two of the top three shot blockers to st- statistically in the league now. Yeah. That's cool. Shot blocking is not what's going to How'd that win work out for Terrence Mann in the corner? But I'm just saying, like, you, you, everybody gets enamored. To win a championship in this league, you have to score in transition. You have to shoot the three. And you have to play half-court half defense. That it's It really is that simple. They have to be able to guard the perimeter in the half court. It, it, it is as simple as that. And that probably means that Rudy Gobert can't be on the floor to do that. Yeah. So there you go. I feel Good like, talk. I feel Good like talk. much more of a man now. Woo! Okay. All right. Good. Go Good. ahead and give us a thumbs up. Good. If you're here right now, please give us a thumbs up and a like. I'm a man! Uh, a couple of things we need to talk about. So I don't eat candy very much ever at all. Okay. So over the weekend... Um, we went and got our Epic Passes printed out up at uh, Park City Mountain Resort. Which, needless to say, you ready? You ready? Needless to say, that was epic. See what I did there? Epic Passes, that was epic. I put it all together. Professional transition. You see that? I don't get it. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Anyway, so we had an epic weekend up at PCMR. Um, <laughs> and one of the things we did is we rode the gondola up to the top of the mountain, mid-mountain really. But, you know, up to one of the higher reaches of the mountain, and we hiked down to the base. Mm-hmm. Took us an hour to do that. Um, and so my legs aren't functioning today. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday was rough. It was a two-mile hike straight downhill. Yesterday was rough. I feel better today. But we had, I burned 6,000 calories on Saturday. So one of the things we did is we stopped on um, at Maverick on 9, 9 South yep. and got a candy bar because we needed the carbs. I think Snickers is the best candy bar by far. Like, yeah. A, I didn't really chew it or taste it, so I can't really comment on that. <laughs> That's a joke I did. Uh, I could have picked any candy bar I wanted. I, I got a Snickers bar. And it was, as they say, Snickers satisfies. I haven't had a candy bar in months. I mean, long time. I just don't eat. I don't eat much confection sugar, and it was spectacular. <laughs> it was awesome. It was everything that you wanted. Just so you can go to Pound Town. And I did. I was aroused. Um, <laughs> it was. It was amazing. Best candy bar is um, oh Snickers for Snickers, sure. Um, uh, Reese's peanut butter cups. No, that's an, oh my god! Don't start this debate. Don't. Do not. A hot dog's a sandwich. Bro, a Reese's peanut Reese's butter cups is a candy peanut bar. peanut butter cups are not candy bars, dude. They're candy, not candy bars. They are not candy bars. And they are not better than a Snickers either way. Now, Twitch you want or to Snickers? T- you want, uh, it's close. That's really close. <laughs> Twix and Snickers are really close. Okay. Okay, let me ask you this. Halloween's coming. What do you like to give out for candy? Reese's pumpkins. Yeah. Pumpkins are where it's at. No, trees are where it's at, but pumpkins happen to be for the season. Okay. See, I am a guy of simple tastes. Right. Now, I'm a guy of simple tastes. You see, I'm a guy of simple tastes. Um, I am somebody who, on Halloween... So, we, we will be home this year for Halloween. Right. So, 
I'm probably just going to do full candy bars. I'll go to Costco. For us, though, right? We're going to eat all those, right? No, the ones we give away. Oh, okay. And I will probably just buy, I'll probably spend 100 bucks on Halloween candy, something like that. And I'll give out full candy bars. Because my asshole neighbors, when I was a kid, okay, kids, here's an apple. <laughs> hey, uh, how about a cucumber? It vexes me. Right? Like, and we egg their house for doing that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. I didn't. I TP'd some houses for that. It is what it is. But I had a lot of neighbors who thought it was cool. Here's some, uh, here's some uh, Granny Smith apples. <laughs> like, you're an, if you do that, you're an asshole. You're a because bad person. Because it's garbage. Yeah, you're a bad person. If you give out fruit on ho on Halloween, you're a bad person. <laughs> Where are we at in society today? You should go straight to hell. <laughs> now, having said that, if you give out those, what are those things? The 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 small circle, just like blocks of sugar, they come in the little wrapper tubes, the different colored candies, Smarties. Smarties. Oh. Smart. If you give out Smarties, you can fuck all the way off <laughs> because those are. <laughs> Those are not candy, okay? Oh. On Halloween, you're giving out candy. <laughs> you are fake. That means chocolate. <laughs> okay, I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Snickers are so good after dieting. Oh. But see, now, and this is something that I had a big, uh, a big Twitter conversation about a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. I don't diet. Okay, what do you do? My wife, who is a cult leader um, and who routinely domestic violences me by making me hike down mountains. Nazis. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> we don't diet. We have completely changed the way we eat. So um, you diet? No, we don't diet. Oh. Okay. Um, like, we just, we, we've changed the way we've eaten. And, and Meaning what? Meaning that we don't, well, I did have Wendy's yesterday. Yeah. The best fast food burger ever. That's every day. Um, <laughs> but we don't generally, we don't eat out very much. And if we do, we go, we actually go big. We go to like Ruth's Chris or, but when, you know, when, like we cook at home, we meal prep, like we just don't eat a lot of sugar at all. We don't eat baked goods. Um, like you just got to cut that stuff out. Mm -hmm. I haven't had soda in 12 years. I figured out the other day. I was talking to somebody at work and I was like, you know, I want to say, I, I remember it was at McCovey's. Yes. In Walnut, Walnut Creek. Creek. That was the last time that I had soda. By the way, the last time that day you had soda and the last time we were ever there, we got cops called on us because we were messing around as we left that restaurant and we were like rolling all over the car. Do you remember that? You don't remember that? I don't. So we roll out of the restaurant, right? And we were we were like messing around, having a good time. We were laughing. I can't remember what we were like. We were just having fun. And and we like rolled against the back of the car. Like we were just goofing around. We go home, right? Ten minutes later, the cops roll up. Hey, someone called call like someone called us about your car. Do you own this car? Yeah, we own this car. Yeah, you know, it looked like you guys were drunk coming out of McCovey's. Have you had anything to drink today? Oh, I do remember that. And, and I it was do like remember that, that. That was the last time we had soda. That's how I always remember. I do remember that. Yeah. Wow. We shouldn't do that. Wow. Well, I, I miss Walnut Creek. I loved living there. You just can't live in California right now. Yeah. But anyway, the point is, yeah. so I haven't had a soda since, and that was 2012. Yeah. So I haven't had a soda since 2012. Yeah. And I don't miss it. Like, I drink a lot of water. I drink a lot of Rockstar. That's sugar-free, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to make a lifestyle change. So anyway, so we went hiking. My wife chained me to um, the top of a mountain and threw me down the hill. Um, I will chain you to a pipe! And then constantly said, let's go, fatty, as I tried to sit down and... No, she didn't. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been amazing. And so, by the way, Saturday, Saturday, yeah. I will say, uh huh, two twenty-five, ten times. Uh huh. Do you even lift? That's right. I do actually. Yeah. Um, like I, I, it feels good to be in good shape, to be losing inches, to be. I'm actually losing two pounds a week right now. Yeah, and that's gonna go up too, because now uh, snowboarding season's almost here. So now yeah. We're up and up in the cardio, up in the core. <sighs> Hawaii is six weeks away, if you can believe that. Yep. 
six weeks away is Hawaii now for us. So, and by the way, over Thanksgiving, we're going to probably miss about a week and a half of shows. And I won't be sorry. Um, but I'm stoked about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely stoked about it. Jake, any update on the school teacher? Does she eat candy? <laughs> wow. Uh, no, the school teacher was in Yellowstone over the weekend uh, with her sister. So she was out of town. Uh, I'm seeing her mm. Tuesday or Wednesday. So, <coughs> so they keep it in the family. Yeah. Uh huh. That's always nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, three musketeers bars are nice. Dude, get the hell Tanner. out of here. Tanner, come on, dude. Like, you're someone who's here every day, and you just rolled up with three musketeers. See, Tanner, like, I even tweeted eagles at you yesterday, and, like, I try to be nice. And We're then, getting somewhere. You know, like, how do you repay me for that? You you say three musketeers bars. Uh. Grow up. <laughs> Man, put on boxer shorts instead of tidy whities <laughs> Sometimes I think I just say shit. Sample what comes out of my mouth. The Nye guy, <laughs> the Nye guy says, Three Musketeers, dude, starving kids in Africa won't touch that crap. <laughs> Tanner says, Don't be so sure about that. <laughs> Marilyn Newren says, Built Bars. Boy, Marilyn Newren is wearing them blue sunglasses, man. <laughs> Built Bars. Um, never had a Built Bar. I'm a one bar guy. Um, you know, Jake. Um, Marilyn says less sugar means you live longer. Mm-hmm. Um, Giggity wants to know if the teacher, if your teacher was at Yellowstone to uh, see a geyser erupt. That was probably later in the trailer. Um, <laughs> by the way, Old Faithful, you've seen it once, you've seen it a thousand times. Uh-huh. I want to live in a van down by the river. Exactly. Um, I thought you were a Twix guy, Barry says. Well, I am a Twix guy. But my go-to when I'm going to have one candy bar every six months. Hold on. Is this the berry from New York? Or no. This is no, a different no. berry. Well, I didn't tell you about Ace's meltdown. Oh, what happened with Ace? This is always good. You can always rely on Ace for a meltdown. Yeah, Ace says he's never coming back to the show um, because he said that we shame and embarrass people who are not vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> and that um, he felt he, – he essentially said he felt out of place here because we mock people – um, for exercising their American freedoms. Well, you know, hey, I, I great. If if you don't want to, if you if you can't handle the facts, dude, cool. We'll see it because all the facts point to not being vaccinated leads to you being in the ICU. Oh and no, you then saying, he hey, I wish those, I got vaccinated. He, he says those numbers are skewed because Joe Biden's president and he oh, wants to it's look Joe good. Biden. And, it's Joe Biden. And right. then he got really upset when I, because he's a huge Trump guy. Right. And so I said to him, by the way, isn't Donald Trump the one that came up with the vaccine? It's not Joe Biden. It's Donald Trump. And he's like, he told me to F off. I'm out. And he blocked me. <laughs> Infowars.com. Classic. I, you know, that's fine. Cool, man. Cool. Um, Tanner says, Monty, you were trying to be nice yesterday saying Tricky Tanner needs a wellness check. LOL. Uh, I was worried about you because the Eagles were in position to win that game. And then they um, brought they brought in Nick Foles. And, oh, wait. Um, they brought in Carson Wentz and he got hurt. Oh, wait. Um, no, he doesn't play there anymore. They Anyway. Uh, you know. Tymon Scott says, 100 grand bars don't get the attention they deserve. I agree with that. I agree with that. Milky Way or Snickers? Snickers all Snickers day. Snickers all day. Snickers all day. Yeah. Mike and Ike's or Reese's Pieces? Ugh. Oh, dude. Don't tell me you don't know. Don't tell me you haven't cracked the code on this. Oh, you, yeah. You, you mix gotta, them together, You got to mix those two together. Yeah, bro. Come on. Come on. Are you guys going back to the movies yet? I want to, but I haven't. The new Bond film's out. Now, I'm triple vaccinated. I got my booster triple shot. Triple vaccinated. Well, so are you. The ultimate protection. Okay, so let me ask you this. Co- <laughs> COVID is raging, and it looks like cases are slightly down. Yeah. Should we go back to the gym and play basketball? Because uh, I, I need the cardio. Fine. I think we're fine. That's my opinion. You think we're fine? Yeah, I think we're fine. All three of us here at Compound Monty. Monty. Monty hey, baby. Hello. Uh, all three of us here at Compound Monty uh-huh. are triple vaccinated. Triple vaccinated. Triple vaxxed. <laughs> um, the ultimate sheep, according to Ace. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it that people have to, like, get all pissed off when you disagree? It's an antibody cocktail. It's so frustrating. I don't know. But, yeah, hey. no, I think we're fine. Right. Real cool. quick. Real yeah. quick. On this um, Facebook story last night. Yeah. Um, 
Did you guys see the story on 60 Minutes? I'm I'm a nerd. Nerd. Oh, it was all over Twitter. Um, whistleblower Francis Haugen, former Facebook data scientist, blew the whistle and did a 60 Minutes interview last night and said that Facebook values revenue more than they value people. And that um, there were conflicts of interest between what was good for the public and what was good for Facebook. And Facebook over and over and over again chose to optimize its own revenue and interests, like making more money than protecting people. Yeah. She also said that there is internal data at Facebook that shows Instagram raises the level of suicides amongst young and teen girls. Because it is so visual and it misrepresents reality. Yeah. Do you use Facebook? Uh, not nearly as much as I used to. It is on my phone. Yeah. Sometimes I'll use it for like car community stuff or, you know, but I don't use it like every day posting and well, interacting and, I, and all that. Last night I unlinked my Instagram and my Facebook page because I had it linked where every time I posted on Instagram, it would post to my Facebook page. Yeah. So I unlink those two now. Mm -hmm. I think I am not going to, I, I am going to remove the Facebook app from my phone mm -hmm. and I'm no longer going to use Facebook because I think that little of it. And I have a page for the show that I don't often use. Yeah. But it's got, they have access, I think. I think I was looking, they have access to almost, almost two-thirds of the world's population. Yeah. Two-thirds of the world's population are impacted by Facebook. Yeah. And I, I don't know, like, I, I don't enjoy Facebook. I don't enjoy Facebook well, because what do it's... You, which ones do you enjoy? TikTok and Instagram. And, and I, you know, obviously I love Twitter. I use Twitter every day, multiple times. It's how I, I mock mock people like Tanner for being an Eagles fan. <laughs> um, I kid. I actually like Tanner. Somebody said, why do you not like Tanner? I do like Tanner. It's a it's a fun back and forth. Tanner's like my little brother. Like, you know. Hey, little buddy. Hey, can I come to Hawaii with you guys? No, fuck off. You can't. <laughs> anyway, the point is, the point is, <laughs> I'm kidding, Tanner. I don't use Facebook anymore. Yeah. I really don't. I just am I think I think Twitter and really I'm a if you don't follow me on TikTok, you're not living life. I mean And it's really you're gonna start not. turning into the show. Because that's that's really what it's gonna start turning yeah, into. Yeah, I mean it, and you can find me on TikTok uh the Monty Show, M O N T Y the Monty Show, um, is where you find me on TikTok. I just I can't not do Facebook. I, I, I like Instagram, I like using Instagram, but it bothers me to know that young girls and they're talking about 10, 11 through like 17, 18 struggle. And there's statistics now that show teen girls feel like they want to commit suicide more because of their interactions on Instagram. Yeah. And the rate of young and teen girls suicide is up for those that use Instagram. How do we support that? How do we support Facebook when we know that they're well aware that they have disinformation? Did you guys see that Rudy Giuliani testified in court that he got the idea for a disinformation campaign on the election from Facebook? Like the first time that he thought of that and executed that was through a Facebook post. Like that should tell you. Like the Trump campaign admitting that they used Facebook to knowingly spread lies. That should tell you all you need to know about Facebook. Yeah. Like this stop the steal thing. Like the very fact that the insurrection that took place on January 6th, that was all powered by Facebook. Yeah. It's not good. I just, I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Listening to you guys on Percocet while recovering is so great and funny. The Nye guy says, thank you. Uh, Greg Hawkins says, Instagram is okay. TikTok is way cooler than uh, I originally thought it would be. Twitter is great for news and chatter, but Facebook is toxic. Yes, it is. Bryce Jensen says, I'm not worried about Facebook, there, but there's obviously cameras in the, in the vaccine. Stay safe, guys. Exactly right. <laughs> Brian Mortensen says, Twix aren't even close to Snickers. Are you cracked? 
man, I don't know. You The first time you ever – the problem is you have to get trained on how to eat Twix. Crack, ice, boom, pow. pow. Like you can't just put a Twix bar in your mouth and chew it. You have to eat the caramel off the cracker first. And where did you learn this technique? Um, in a massage parlor. Really? You and Bob Kraft, good friends? <laughs> um, I don't know where I learned it. Oh, okay. I believe I'm self I, I I'm you, self-taught in the pleasure department. Oh, okay. Nice. Um good for you, man. But yeah, you have to eat the caramel off the top of it. So I said, yeah. I gotta tell that Snickers bar was so good. Yeah. I don't know how long it had been since I had candy, but it had been a, a while, dude. It had been a long while. Long while. Long, so long. I see while. you made a change to the shoe on the display, Monty. Yeah, that's an Air Jordan 5 Oreo. Jake, how do you like that shoe? Yeah, it's bullshit. Jake doesn't own that. Yeah. Monty slurping the caramel off of a wafer. Damn right. Yeah, you know. Do you guys like Hershey's Kisses? Love them. <laughs> Love a Hershey's Kiss. You know what? I, I, uh, the Ghirardelli caramel chocolate. Oh, oh, dude, come on, come on, dude. Undefeated. Chocolate and caramel together. I mean, forget it's undefeated. it. Forget it. Forget it. I mean, it's the best thing in the world. Legit question. Do you have to wait six months after your second vaccine dose to get a COVID booster? You do. You do. Or if you mean you're triple vaxxed, you got to wait another six months. Bryce Jensen says, Monty, don't get started on sucking. You don't want to become Gobert's jump shot. <laughs> <laughs> Had to go there, didn't you? Wow, Play the music. dude. Play the music. James Knight says, have you guys tried an Aussie Tim Tam? I actually think we did when we were there. I don't remember. We got to go back to Australia. Giggity says, Ghirardelli can't be beat. I would agree. Um, which vaccine did you get? <laughs> Pfizer all three times. J&J and, and Pfizer. Thanks for listening. Please give us a thumbs up. If you are here right now, please hit that like button. Really helps the channel grow. We are zooming to 2,500 subs. Or as Ace says, sheep. Uh, we are at 2,321. Under 200 to go, guys. Under 200 like, to go until it, we give in. away the Traeger Smoker in thine Xbox. Come on, let's go. Get it done. Hit subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. Appreciate you being here. Until tomorrow, say goodbye, Jake. Goodbye, Jake.